Alrighty, here we go. My name is Travis Neville. This is the Travis Neville Podcast. I think we're at episode 45. Not too shabby. Um, I wrote this book called The Jospin Method. You can get that all kinds of different places. Amazon, uh, Audible, Barnes & Noble, uh, etc. That book is about digging yourself out of the hole. How to recover from... Difficult shit. Um, I specifically highlight myself in there. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was in a situation where I left my ex-wife. It was a bad situation. I ended up uh, a couple weeks later getting arrested for pot possession. <laughs> uh, basically losing my teaching career at that same time. Lost a lot of family, all that, or a lot of friends and neighbors and stuff. And anyway, how I got out of that. But as depressing as that sounds, the book's actually very upbeat. Now, the second one uh, went to the publisher on Thursday. It's going to be called, right now, it's going to be called The Ideal Man. Um, the subtitle is Reviving Masculinity. I talk specifically about, um, you know, what are the things that, uh, that men should be doing? What are the things that, um, what are the reasons why men aren't the men they used to be? I mean, you're going to be hard-pressed to find somebody uh, who isn't going to say, there's no real men anymore, you know, especially women love to say that. Um, you know, I talk a lot about in the new book about the media and how, how that has impacted things. and um, Lots of good shit. Did a ton of research, did a bunch of organizing. I'm excited to get it back from my editor, which should be within the next couple of weeks here, certainly before Christmas, and I can, you know, we'll be bouncing around that editing process, and we'll see how it comes out, but... Um, Today I want to talk about, uh, it's kind of the same shit, I wanted to talk about this this note I wrote down uh, several weeks ago, and it's just still kind of an incomplete thought, and I thought if I did a show about it, it would help me to kind of flesh it out, but it's, it's male disposability, it's male disposability, and the first time that it popped into my head, I was up on a, a 40 foot ladder, which is pretty fucking high. That's like a three-story ladder. That's going to get you up to a peak on a three-story building. Uh, it's a big, heavy son of a bitch. Uh, borrowed it up from borrowed it from my buddy, my buddy Eric, who's a great dude. I have lots of ladders, but you don't often need a forty. Every couple of years, you need something that big. And I was doing this job, and anyway, so here I am at the top of this uh, this forty-foot ladder, and I'm doing this really nice house that's on a lake. And uh, it was windy as fuck. It was kind of cold out because it's like fucking November. It was like it was the last job I did before I shut down uh, for the winter. And um, I'm up there going, Travis, what in the fuck are you doing up here? <laughs> 40 feet high. There's nobody there. I'm by myself. There's not even anybody in the house. The homeowners aren't there. I could have fallen off that ladder and, you know, broken my neck or certainly been pretty fucked up from it. And uh, I was like, well, you know, what the fuck are you doing? You know, that, that's kind of going through my head. It popped in my head for a minute at least. And I thought about, you know, the, be the beginning of, um, you know, when that started for me. I started painting houses. Uh, shit, it's, it's this. It's going to be 1997. Holy shit, it's a long time ago. And, you know, I got offered a, a job, a, a buddy a buddy of mine, his dad had a painting company and I needed it. This is, this is how I paid my way through college. So he's like, man, it's, it's eight bucks an hour to start. And I'm like, holy fuck, that's a small fortune. Back then, uh, minimum wage was 425. So it's like double minimum wage. I'm like, fuck, I'm in, you know, I want to go to college and this is going to help me. So, and I can remember very quickly becoming the guy who did the difficult shit. You know, I got all the way up. I did the highest ladder moves. I did double ladder moves. I'd have a 40 up on a roof and then another ladder kind of jacked off of that. And, and, uh, you know, I would do all kinds of crazy shit. And I don't really ever remember being that afraid to me that the upside was way outweighed the potential risks. First of all, you know, at the time I'm, I don't know, 20, 20 years old. And, uh, you know, I'm like, you just don't have any kind of sense of mortality. You know, you think that you're you're going to live forever and nothing's ever going to kill you, nothing's ever going to hurt you. So I wasn't even, I wasn't thinking about that. What I was thinking about is I get to be the guy. You know, all the other dudes on this painting crew, and a lot of them were my friends, um, are going to see that I'm the one who's up there doing that shit. You know, I'm going to be, I'm going to have that 
kind of cachet. You know, I'm going to get that recognition. I'm going to have that respect from my my peers. And it was a legit thing. I mean, I, I ended up being the guy in every job I ever worked. I was the guy that was way up there. You know, and like I said, at that time, it didn't even cross my mind. I'm just like, fuck yeah, it was totally worth it. I, I knew that if I'd have gone home that night and somebody else had done that tough shit, I'd have been like, man, I was a, I was a bitch today. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I could have had an opportunity there to shine, and I didn't take it. And I'm not saying that's a bad motivation. I think that's a good motivation, and I'm glad. I still think that way. I just don't tend to take the physical risks like I used to, but... uh you know, that got me thinking about this male disposability thing. And, and what really, again, I wrote down that term, you know, weeks ago. And then, um, you know, I, I've been reading this book called uh, The Rational Male. And it was, uh, you know, I talk a lot about Jack Donovan. And I think he has pretty much agreed to do a foreword for the new book. So I'm super pumped to get that to him and see what he's going to say. What an honor. You know what I mean? He's a guy that I look up to. He's at least five years ahead of me in this in this thing. And Anyway, I was looking up some of his shit, and this guy, Rolo Tomasi, popped up as somebody who was associated with him or somebody who was similar to him or whatever. And I don't know if they know each other. I've got, I don't know that. but um, And his book is called The Rational Mail. I'm like, all right, shit, I'll check that out. And um, So I've been reading it. I read it all weekend. I'm still not quite done, but I'm mostly done with it. And I'm, what I'm getting is uh, it's just not quite as mature as my work. I think that's, yeah, that's basically it. Like, basically, The Rational Male is is the book that I have coming out, but it's what I would have written in 1997 <laughs> when I was up on that 40-foot ladder the first time. Uh, that's how it's kind of set up. It's more about, um, you know, how to you know, pick up women, how to maintain respect in your relationship, how to, I mean, there's a lot of really good shit in there, but, uh, again, it's just not quite as mature, I don't think. It's just a little more immature. Uh, but lots of the things he says in there, um, you know, kind of got that flame fanned, the whole idea of disposability of, of men. I started thinking about, well, shit, you know, all this research I've done, there's a lot of instances of that, you know, and I, I looked at, you know, I just looked at myself, shit, I'm up on these, doing these difficult ladder moves, why the fuck do I do that? There's not even any, I don't even have a crew of guys around to impress or to gain respect from. Um, I'm just out there doing it myself, and uh, well, granted, I'll make, I'm not shitting you, I'll make three, four, five hundred dollars an hour to do that kind of work. <laughs> it, it's... It's the kind of money that you just can't say no to. I am physically fit. Uh, I know how to do all of that shit. I've got the gear. I've got the equipment. It's easy money, but you got to take the risk. You know what I mean? You got to take some risks. Um, and for me, that's still okay. That's still worth doing it. You know, it is. But that idea, that concept of willing to take these big risks for respect, for admiration, for some kind of recognition, um, I think that's a male thing. I don't even think that's, that is a fucking male thing. Like when you read this, the new book, you'll see, I've got a ton of research in there about, um, you know, exactly what it is that motivates men. There's all, there've been a lot of studies on it. There's a, it's even been called a syndrome. Uh, you know, the, the young male syndrome, I think it's called YMS, uh, th that idea that you're willing to take risks to gain notoriety, to build your status, to create who you are. And I'm not going to tell you for a second that that's a bad thing. Because, I mean, let's think about it. What are the things that most men are going to do to uh, kind of chase that? You know what I mean? What, where, where, are the, where are the routes they're going to pick? Well, we can start with the construction trades. I mean, that's I would tell you that's 95% men in the construction trades. As far as the hands-on pros, the people who are the building that you're sitting in to uh, to listen to this, the car that you're driving uh, to listen to this, they're built by men. The roads that you're driving down, built by men. Um, men do that shit. N over 99% of people who are masons in the world are men. 
Um, that could be a pretty dangerous task. I mean, you lift these heavy bricks, bricks and you could get injured and you can got to go up high on some stuff. And, you know, there's certainly some danger there. You're using heavy equipment, all that stuff. And I don't have to go into the, the dangers that are inherent in these sorts of trades. Um, the construction just is that way. I mean, you know, driving ice road truckers. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's pretty dangerous. That's all dudes. Um, and what's the back end? Well, shit, you know, you're probably getting a lot of money to do that, that dangerous shit. You know, and there's a, there is a natural manliness about working in construction. I mean, I would be lying if I didn't, t if I told you that that wasn't satisfying for me because it is. I mean, I like having a big truck with a bunch of fucking ladders on it and shit like that. That's fucking cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's cool. Like, I was up north this weekend and I was driving around, you know, my car, which is a, like it's, a, it's like a luxury car. There's nothing manly about it, I don't think, but uh, it's a great car. But, um, you know, I'm up north, and it's kind of more of a blue collar area. And, you know, I'm, I'm stopping at a bar or a restaurant or whatever, and, and I'm like, oh, all these big trucks are on. I'm driving a little car parked in there, you know? Um, anyway, I think that men, you know, they obviously look past this. And, you know, when I read, I, I told you, I spent a lot of time reading that uh, The Boy Crisis by Dr. Warren Farrell, which was awesome. Like I said, loaded with good research. He's an older guy. So I think that what he is is a further evolved uh, version of where I am, right? I told you there's a big difference between 1997, Travis Neville on a 40-foot ladder, and 2021, Travis Neville on a 40-foot ladder. I'm looking at life a little bit differently, and I think that's very natural. As you get older, you, you look at things differently. Well, he takes it to the extreme that there should be no contact sports, um, you know, guns are illegal, should, should be illegal. Like he really goes into it, but he talks about how we've got to get to the point where men have to see their value primarily as being a father. Um, and, uh, I just don't, I think that's an unrealistic expectation. I think that we can make being a father more, uh, uh appreciated more valued we can make it more of a thing where it can be a little closer to being up on that 40 you know what i mean where your, your boys are gonna be like fuck good job dude that's some kick-ass fathering i know that kind of doesn't sound right but i think that can be done i don't think you got to take away all the other shit that guys get their kind of masculine boost from you don't have to take all that away uh which is what Farrell talks about but the fucking guy's in his 60s man he's soft as fuck he's got no testosterone in him anymore you know, of course he thinks that way. He's basically a woman. And like I told you, he spent most of his adult productive years working with the, the biggest feminist organization in the country, probably the world. So, yeah, he's a little different in his perspective. But what he does get right is that disposability aspect about how guys get into these things, get into playing football, and you're all going to get CTE, every one of you. You're going to get CTE and die. You know, that's how he fucking looks at it because he's a pussy, but... Um, I don't think you need to go that far. There's nothing wrong with the stuff that men do. I mean, you tell me how we're going to get it done without them. How are we going to get that shit across that ice ice road up into the, you know, into the Bering Sea or wherever the fuck they're taking that shit? Um, who's going to build that road you're driving on? Who's going to do anything made out of bricks? Who's going to climb that 40-foot ladder? You know, that's what men are, you know, that's one of the things we're here for. And that's one of the things we're happy to get done. Now, I would tell you that there's a there's a vacuum behind that in a lot of cases. Um, I've said this all over and over again that that men follow praise wherever the awards are, wherever the the recognition is, wherever the respect is. Those are the routes men are going to take, and a lot of times in adulthood that gets boiled down into money essentially because money becomes kind of the universal. Uh, praise, right? You make more money, sweet. You know, that's the thing that kind of everyone understands. There, there's a lot of respect there. There's a lot of cachet behind it. Um, but uh, that's not always the best thing. And I was going to wait a minute to get into this, but I'm going to go ahead and jump into it now. This this disposability aspect, and I've talked about this before. Uh, you know, I said this in one of my shows that, um, you know, I kind of called dudes out like, because so I'm going to agree with you, there's a lot of soft-ass pussy men out there who are not pulling their fucking weight, who spend their day 
you know, doing shit that's completely unproductive. And are, they're, they're terrible fucking masculine role models if they have kids. Um, they're not very good partners if they have, if they have partners. Um, there's lots of guys like that. I think that number has increased exponentially based on lots of factors. And you'll, again, that's in the new book too. But uh, this idea, the idea that I presented, I said to, to men, I can't remember, I think it was the De-Evolution Man podcast. I can't remember which number that was, but I said, hey guys, what are you bringing to the table besides some sperm and a paycheck? And I stand by that. I think that's a great way to look at it. I know it's an oversimplification, but um, really, you better have an answer. I mean, what are you bringing to the table? Because if you're not bringing anything else to the table, the way that in the last hundred years, women have improved uh, their lot in life and women have strengthened and done all this shit means that you are disposable to them. Okay. That's exactly how it comes out. You're disposable. Um, once you've given them the sperm and they know they've got your paycheck locked down, they know they're going to get a bunch of it in a divorce situation. They're going to be able to keep the house you bought for them. They'll just fucking get rid of you. If you can't bring anything else to the table, you're disposable. Um, that's the way it is. Uh, you know, I don't like it, but that is the way it works. I, I spent some time today um, researching that concept. I'm like, is there a difference in mindsets between men and women, women with regard to that disposability? I, I think that it's, um, and I don't know, fuck, I don't know as far as this goes, because I can think, you can always think of fucking examples. There's always outliers no matter what, but in general, women have a much easier time jumping into the next relationship than men do. Um, you know, when I talk to single women, what are their complaints about the, the dating pool? Um, it's down the list of shit. It's maybe, you know, one of eight or nine things they'll talk about will be this idea that, well, men are, you know, I keep running into guys who are not ready for a relationship. They haven't healed yet from their relationship. And when I talk to, to men about that, dude, how's the dating world going for you? That is the number one, the number one complaint. complaint. All of these women on these dating websites, and this is what I'll hear, uh, just got out of a relationship or they're still fucking in it. And they're, you know, say they say women pack their bags six months before they, they leave. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's fucking true. You can see them start getting ready. All of a sudden they're working out. All of a sudden they're doing all this shit. And you know, you can just tell that it ain't right. Um, that happens. And, uh, and they'll just, they'll jump right into the next relationship. Um, that's super common. Women will just do that shit. I see it all the time. Like a, a buddy of mine recommended, Hey man, uh, he said that he dated this girl and he said that she wouldn't date him or he tried to date her. She wouldn't date him once she found out that he hadn't been out of, uh, his relationship for 12 months. And he said that once she explained it and he started thinking about it, he adopted the rule himself. And I do that same thing. So I'll ask somebody if I'm going to, Hey, how long has it been? And if it hasn't been a year, I'm like, sorry, you know, I, <laughs> And I know, like I said, that, like I told you, women will pack their bags six months before they leave. So maybe the six months is really a year. And anyway, here is why that's easier for women. It's due to the disposability of men, very, very, very frankly. So think about uh, you're in a fucking cave. You got uh, fucking saber two tigers and hyenas and wolves and whatever. I've, all these kind of threats that are going to be in cave society, right? Well, who's going to fight those fucking savage, those, uh, those threats, whether it's uh, somebody roving bands of other, from other tribes or who's the one that's going to put their life on the line? Well, it's going to be men. Okay. So they're going to go out there and they're going to fight. And why, why are they doing it? All right. Let's, let's boil it all down to the fucking cave here. Okay. All we got is fucking cave. So there's no, you're not going to promote it on social media. There's not going to be an award. There's not going to be, you know, maybe a few peers, but Essentially, it's for it's for the women. They're looking to fucking score, basically. You know, like if you're the guy, if you're the young, uh, young brave who goes out and counts coup, and you got all these eagle feathers, and you're a badass, every chick's gonna want to fuck you. You know, that's why you do it. Uh, so you go out there, but that's part of the game. You, you're, you're climbing that forty foot ladder. And you might fall off and die. Women don't do that shit. So men haven't evolved to be able to recover very quickly because most, 
you know, men, women are a lot more careful. They're fucking more careful. They're a lot, the fucking, let's think about today. Let's look at war. Selective service when you're 18. If you're a guy, you have to register for the draft. You don't have to if you're a woman. You know, I mean, shit, there's, I can talk about the inequities all, all over the place. And that's not what this show's about. We're specifically talking about the disposability of men and why, why that is. What's, what's the story here? Why is it, why is it going that way? Uh, but that's what it is, you know, f from cave culture all the way to till today, men have taken the risks, men have been the ones building the bridges, building the skyscrapers, making the money, because they want to, I mean, there's lots of reasons behind that, you want to, but of course you want to impress your woman, you want to take care of her, you want to, that's part of the game, that's what we do as men, we compete, we uh, go out there and Take care of business and shit. You can look at. I mean, I talk about the the discrepancy between your heart and your mind all the time. I think it's a much broader one with women. They uh, sadly, you know, your what you really want, what your body wants, what your genetics want, what you're fully attracted to uh, with women tends to be sometimes further away from uh, from from what their mind is going to want, what their mouth is going to say to you that they want. Uh, with men, it's usually a little bit closer. Um, and I would my evidence of that is this. You can't pick who with whom you fall in love, right? You can't pick that. It's not up to you. Um, either you're going to have that draw to them or you aren't. Um, you can make a list of all the best fucking traits and you meet that person, they check every box and you just got you just dead inside. You got nothing for them. And you can meet somebody that checks none of those boxes. And all you want to do, you, all you want to do is be with you. you can fall in love with them in a second. Like that's happened to me. That's happened to lots of people. You know that's how it is. And my point is that your base desire, your ability to fall in love with someone, your your desire to reproduce with them, your genetic desire, it's different than your your cognitive, your logical mind. And for women, of course, they want the the badass. Of course, they want the taller guy, the more athletic guy, the guy with the good genetics, so that their children are going to be big, athletic, more likely to be a leader, more likely to be able to survive, more capable. You know, that's just a genetic thing. I mean, that's how they do it. I mean, and you can you can do the research over and over again. You know, l women only cheat up. What I mean by that is they'll marry the dude that's maybe equal with them or maybe a little bit above. Uh, but when they cheat, they go for the guy that's more successful. They're fucking their boss. Or they're, you know what I mean? They're fucking the foreman. You know, that's that's who they're cheating with. Men don't give a shit. If she's hot, he'll fuck her. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's usually how, that's how that goes. Um, uh, you know, or she's sexually aggressive or whatever it is. Like, that's that's how that goes. But, uh, yeah, no, and I, I don't mean any judgment by this. I mean, I hope you guys who watch this shit, you've, you've figured that out. I'm not trying to pigeonhole anybody. I'm not trying to piss anybody off. I'm not taking sides. In fact, I mean, if you really look at it, if I'm going to take sides, it's going to be, hey, men, get your shit together. It says it right in my fucking, sh my logo, you know, and that's what it's for. Uh, that's what we're here to try to do to help help guys get their shit together. And I'm not doing it from a terrible place, like, you motherfucker. It's more like, hey, man, here's how you do it. Here are the things that can help you. You know what I mean? Um I'm reading the books. I'm doing the research. I'm trying to boil that down and give it to you in bite-sized chunks so that you don't have to spend the time. You can just get the best out of it and uh, like take the cliff notes that I'm going to give you, apply them to your life, and, and go on from there. Um, you know That's the point of it. But um, anyway, disposability of men. There's a, uh, another thing that I figured that I found as I dug more into this guy, Rolo Tomasi, the guy who wrote Rational Male is he is on this so suave forum he is part of a thing called the manosphere like i started looking into all these things which for lack of a of a better way to characterize it it it's like a male feminism which is why i'm probably not going to be a big advocate of that i think if you're a an activist at all you just need to get your own shit together. You know, I'm I'm on I'm the the Jordan Peterson, you know, frame of logic, which is, you know, just just make your boat better. Don't worry about the flood. You can't stop the flood from coming. You know, so being an ad, you know, an activist. Come on, just get your shit together. Don't go to a fucking protest. Don't rail on a fucking 
you know, website. That's I think that's a waste of time. But I did watch a it's not a recruiting video. It's more like a anyway. I caught it on YouTube and it was talking about this group called MGTOW. MGTOW, and that stands for Men Going Their Own Way. And in the video, they're talking about, and if I can get the link up here, I still don't know how to get links to work, but I can show you the link, or you can just fucking Google it, or get on YouTube and search MGTOW. Um, they're talking about, you know, men going their own way. The idea is this. Dudes who have gone through a divorce, um, and, you know, the court basically gave their wife their kids, gave their wife... Uh, the house that he paid for gave their wife alimony from him, you know, and now he's basically just a, like, again, disposable, and he's off living in a shitty apartment and paying for uh, kids that he sees every couple of weekends and, and paying to support a, uh, an ex-wife that he may or may not still be in love with while some other man gets to live there with, with his family, you know what I mean? Like, that's uh, guys who have gone through that, guys who have... Um, you know, just been fucked by the system, essentially, um, when it comes to women, are now going like, you know what, fuck it, man, I'm not getting remarried, I'm not, I got a very close friend who says the same thing, you know, he's a married guy, I would, uh, he's at least one of the best men I've ever met, excellent husband, excellent father, um, you know, his wife is uh, far from appreciative of that. Like, she essentially is just one of the kids for him. Like, he has to take care of her like he takes care of, the, like, his kids. And I, I tell him that, you know, I counsel him on it, and I'll be like, hey, man, it's, uh, you know, you're allowing them to be that dependent on you because you're so willing to do everything. And, you know, from his perspective, and I completely understand this, he's got that sense of, hey, this is this is part of my identity. This is This is an obligation that I took on as a... As a man marrying this woman and raising these kids, I've got to do these things. And, and if I don't do them, they're not going to get done and they need to be done. And, bro, I get it. I get all that. My point with this is not to take sides or tell you what the fuck's going on. It's this, that he has said to me, if I ever wasn't there, I would never even consider getting remarried. Never. I would go out and just live my life and enjoy my hobbies and do what I do. And, and that's what I would do. He's like, I would never even consider it. No way. And I've heard that from from lots of guys who are married, and you know, somewhat happily. Um, and then I've heard it from other guys who are already out and are like, "Fuck no, I will never do that again." Uh, ran into a guy I was at a football meeting six months ago, and uh, he's like, he's he's like, "Yeah, man, what are you doing tonight?" He's like, "Other than anything I want," <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like, "Guy's been married for a long time. He's just never gonna fucking do it again." And that's this idea again, MGTOW, men going their own way. Um, you know, it's not uncommon common to meet a woman like that either. But I think there's still a social stigma where a woman feels like she's got to have a man in her life. And, you know, that's cool too. But uh, I think it's a reaction. And it's a reasonable reaction, frankly. Um, you know, if, you, if you're a guy getting married, there's, you know, not a lot of upside, honestly. You know, you're doing that for, for your woman. She wants to get married, so you're going to marry her. But in the end... I mean, unless she makes a whole lot more money than you do, you're going to get fucked, man. I mean, 54% of them fail. It's more than half. You think you, Nobody thinks they're going to be the one of the one of those, but when you come out the other end, there's not a lot of protections for you, bro. You know, when you look at that shit, it makes sense why there's so many men, you know, women will complain, men, how you can't, can't get any men to commit? I'm like, fuck, <laughs> you know, what's, what's the fucking upside? You know, what, what are you getting out of that? I mean, like, I thought about it for myself. I'm, you know, I'm a single guy. I was married for a while. Um, if I got remarried, what would I have out of that? I'd have health insurance that I didn't have to pay for. I mean, other than that, what do you get that isn't, you don't have just cohabitating? Yeah, we're going to buy a house together. Right? I mean, how is that any different? Because I've had both situations. I've had... People, you know, I've had women that I've lived with for years and that I wasn't married to. And I had a woman that I lived with for years that I was married to. And when I got out of one, I was in a whole lot worse shape than when I got out of the other. I can tell you that. You know, financially, I got hoes. I didn't even have kids. Now, I'm not bitching. I'm really not. But there is this idea. I really am not. I, I don't mean to 
and realize that it might come out like that. But that's not my intention here. It's this idea of the disposability of men in our society. I mean, that's kind of what it's come to. I mean, being a man is like being a lineman. Like on a football field, you know anything about football, you know that the linemen, they don't score touchdowns, they don't make tackles, not usually. Um, you only know who they are or what's going on if they fuck up. They're just grinders. They're in there taking care of business, doing the dirty work. If they fuck up, everybody's going to be all over their shit. But they never get any praise. They never get any glory. At least not publicly, right? But I, I, I dare you. I dare you to have a football game without them. See how that goes, right? That that's what men are. It's like it's like being a fucking lineman. I don't know. Um, like I said at the beginning, this is a it's an incomplete thought. Uh, but I I, I believe that uh, yeah, men are kind of disposable, sadly. And I'm not going to blame that on anyone. I think there are a lot of factors, and I think one of the main factors is that guys continue to do these things that are. Risky, which again I love, man. I, there's a whole, uh, there's a chapter in the new book about taking risks, and how important that is to be a man, to being a man. It, it is. It's, it's uh, super important. I just wonder how much appreciation there really is out there. Not that, you know, that is, that is, like I said, men follow praise. How much praise is is coming with that? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? The, the praise part. Should you just be like me at 45 climbing a ladder, a 40 foot ladder, because I'm getting a few, a lot of money out of it. Is that enough? Or does, should it be more like 1997, Travis, on a 40, where, uh, you know, you're getting props from your boys and, you know, respect from the crew and, you know? I better, better disposable. It's a good argument. All right. My name's Travis Neville. This is the Travis Neville podcast. I wrote this fucking shit right here. And uh, the new book, I'm telling you, it's going to have so much shit in it because I did so much research. There's so much information there. Uh, A lot of stuff that you've heard in the podcast, but a lot of new stuff. Um, Yeah, looking forward to it. Like I said, I heard from the publisher today that the editor has a hold of it. So the first uh, round of editing is happening from their end. And I had to finally just cut myself off because I just kept editing and editing and editing and editing. I'm like, fuck it. You take it. And uh, so we'll see how that comes back. And I'll keep you updated on that. But uh, hope today's show in some way helped you uh, to get your shit together. Have a great week.